up, guys? Today, uh, I've got Kurt Hose on here, and we're going to be talking about uh, his team. Uh, he's the business manager for the Amy Hose team uh, in Medina, and he's going to talk about what made them bring their team over to EXP last April. And uh, Kurt, man, how are you doing? Thanks for being on here with me today. Can't complain. <laughs> I'll say doing good. So before we get started, just give us a give us the, the overall view of the, the team, size of the team, uh, you know, number of agents, number of admin uh, when they came when you came over um, and then like production for 2021. OK, um, so size of the team, I want to say prior to us coming over, I think there was a total of seven or eight of us. Um, I have to count that in my head. Um, right. And we were doing about like, you know, 39, 40 million a year, give or take something like that. Um, been doing it about 15, you know, she's been doing it about 15 years. Amy has my wife. Right. And, uh, now we're at, I think 12 people. Um, and I think we finished 2022 at about 44 million, something like yeah, that. Yeah, that's excellent. And then what company Howard. were you guys uh, with before? Oh, we were at Howard Hanna. Uh, Howard Amy Hanna. was there for, I want to say she started off like the beginning of 2008, um, okay. at how at Prudential, which, uh, doesn't exist anymore. It's a Berkshire hack or. Berkshire, Berkshire Hathaway, Hathaway yeah. office now. Mm -hmm. um, so she started there uh, right at the beginning of 2008. Obviously, that's an interesting time to start in the industry. Yeah, no kidding. Um, and uh, then uh, towards the end of that year, she actually moved to Realty One and uh, then was immediately bought by Howard Hanna. So right, and she got absorbed. She kind of like in three different companies in the first year, not really willingly. It was just yeah, the yeah. Realty One move was she followed someone else over there. And because uh, she was still pretty new, uh -huh. but having some success, and just wanted to wanted to continue growing, right? Um, but uh, but then we wound up there for we were there for about fifteen years and started to grow a you know a small team and right uh, grew our grew our business annually pretty aggressively actually. I mean, we usually about doubled every year for quite oh, a while fantastic. there, and, and that tapers off once you get to a certain point. That that starts to get hard to do once you get above get above like fifteen million or so. It's it's hard to expand hard past to that. Yeah, because while well, you're competing against people that really know what they're doing, then yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, um, and so, that's where every advantage counts. So let me ask you, man. Um, obviously, you guys were in a very comfortable place. Howard Hanna is an excellent company. Um, they've been around for a long time, uh, oh. and if everything's going so well and you're comfortable, uh, what started leading towards this uh, change of platforms? Well, so uh, comfortable is a very interesting concept because you can be comfortable everywhere, even if it's not the best place. Um, I, I think it was a good place for us to be. Mm -hmm. I don't think it was the best place for us to be. And I think that a lot of times, and we are no exception to this, but people fear change. Um, mm -hmm. A lot of times people are hesitant to take action on things. We knew the numbers. I mean, I'm I'm a math guy. I, I go through the math on all this stuff at nauseum. I know numbers on our business so well, it's ridiculous. And I already knew the numbers were not favorable where we were compared to where we are now. Um, and I had done pretty deep exploration of just about every brokerage out there. I mean, I had everything from, you know, real broker to home smart, to Keller, to Remax. I mean, I've looked at every single one and to be perfectly honest, I measured our previous year's train. I took the transactions that we did as a team the previous year and I recalculated them at each and every one of those models. Um, and well, I know- You're a weirdo, man. <laughs> it's a little bit weird. Well, but you'll find it. I bet that's probably not that unique of a story. I think that right. most people that get to this point do that. They, they're obsessive yeah. about success. And, and I think that the hardest part is, as much as I did that, we still weren't that motivated to do anything. We didn't really, it kind of happened fairly quickly. I knew the numbers, but we weren't really in a big hurry to change it because it was working and it was comfortable. Exactly. And I relate a lot of stuff in life to aviation because it's one of the things I'm very passionate about. I've got a pilot's license and I've been doing that for about 10 years. And uh, back when I used to, when I was taking my initial training, I had a really good uh, primary flight, flight instructor who became a really good friend of mine. And he used to have this technique at getting me to do things. Um, and it was pretty interesting. Uh, we would be coming into land and, you know, you get this clammy, almost freeze up thing. And it happens in business too where sometimes you know what's going on, but you're hesitant to do anything about it because you're almost like waiting for something. And he would always get it out of me by going, okay, how do you look? Are you high? Are you low? Are you fast? Are you slow? And I would usually say something like, well, I'm, I'm low and slow. And he wouldn't give me the exact way to do it. He would say, 
do something about it. <laughs> and that has stuck in my head on a lot of things for years that when I see something that we're not doing well or something that could be better, I try to be actionable about it. I try to find a way to take that. The fact that I know is one thing, but the fact that I do something about it is what creates the change and moves the needle and, and gives you positive results. So when we, you know, when we were in that comfort zone for a long time, I was well aware of the numbers, but we still hadn't done anything about it, but we thought, and then there was just that moment that came and we already had kind of a preconceived notion of where we would wind up. Mm -hmm. um, we, you know, we explored a couple things, but it was something that happened in a period over a period of a couple of weeks where honestly, Amy was more hesitant than I was because she's a creature of habit. Mm -hmm. um, I'm running the business and saying, Hey, you know what? We have the opportunity to not only the, the structure was very attractive to us. We could not only bring in more revenue on our side, but I could compensate people better while doing it. Um, and I figured if we were explain, going to explain that real quick, how could you compensate people better? Well, the combination of having a cap, um, I mean, at a you didn't have level, that before at Howard Hanna. No, uh, no, there was a, you know, there's a standard split all year. Um, also some of the things like the admin fee being able to, cause there's an admin fee on almost every real estate transaction in the world. Well, typically that goes to the broker. And I guess that goes towards like record retention, probably some of the structure things that are there. And let's and face it. It's just, it's just profit for them. Basically. Yeah. That's what it is. And we were able to use that to take care of some of the expenses we were already paying basically. <laughs> I mean, so that ate some of the expenses up that we were already paying takes care of having some control in house of transactions and just, it freed up a lot of capital because of the amount of, um, you know, the old school brokerages that have been around hundred years, they've operated in different market conditions very well for hundred years, but the, or hundred over hundred years, probably, I don't know when real estate agents began, but, um, that model worked for a long time and served the industry very well. But once you had the advent of the internet, that's a big disruptor. And I've always been drawn to things that are disruptive because disruptions where the opportunity is um, in everything. So if I can, if I can find something that's um, that not everybody's doing, I know that that's going to give me a result that not everybody's getting. And that was really what drew me to it. So what made you, you know, a team of seven, plus, was that seven agents plus admin? I, I think it was seven agents. We didn't have in-house admin at that point. We had in-house, like an in-house social media manager and Got some it. things like that. Okay. Um, but not a direct admin that processed it. it was mostly we would turn it into the office. And, and sure. honestly, that was kind of a driving force. That was the thing that kind of got Amy off the fence is the office that she worked out of kept going through admins. And it created, I saw it as an opportunity where it's like, look, if, if you're unhappy, this is a perfect time for me to approach her and sell her on the change. Cause she was, you know, she was more of a creature of habit and I'm more of a creature of numbers. Although I didn't ever think that we would, honestly, I didn't ever think we would go anywhere, but when the opportunity came, it was kind of like the skies opened and we just had a chance. And I said, look, this is, I, I got to work and I started, you know, putting a lot together and the amount of work that we put in, in that, four week period because we have branding everywhere. I mean, we run a very marketing heavy business model. It's just the way we've always run the team. Right. And I knew right away that we had a window where all of a sudden it was like all the closings ended at this one point. And there was like a window where it's like, wow, we could make a move there and not leave clients halfway through a deal and all that. And it was, it it's was almost impossible to do by the way. That's, and that's a big, that's a big thing at our level. That's very difficult. And you don't want to just leave clients and not be able to talk to them. I mean, we were able to pretty much clean break and that's hard to do. And that's something where probably our biggest mistake in business was exposed in that moment that the biggest mistake is we took so long to do it um, because it, you get pigeonholed into that. And once, if you do grow in that traditional model, you're kind of trapped there unless you find a way you know, you have to find a hole to do it. And that's very difficult to do. So that was one thing that really like, if we would have caught on to that back when we were doing seven, eight, 10 million a year, it would have been so much easier. Um, whereas I can tell you, it's a logistical nightmare when you've got 20 deals pending at all times. Um, right. We so had uh, we had 28 deals pending when we brought our brokerage over to EXP in yeah. uh, September of 2021. And you guys had a little nuance there where I guess you could probably leave Mary behind and have her. That's what we did. Yeah, yeah, I didn't have anybody screaming at me. I didn't have a door slam in my butt as I was leaving. That was yeah. much easier. Yeah, it's it's a lot trickier when you grow to that point and then you 
you kind of wind up trapped in. So if you're going to grow past the 10 million mark, you better think about where you're at because it is, I can say from experience, that was, I, I probably worked till, and, and Jane, our social media girl did a lot of work for us. Um, there was a couple people that did a lot of stuff to help and, and the team, everybody pitched in and it was, I would say a downright Herculean effort. I mean, it was, it was uh, right, to change everything out, to change everything out, advertising wise, uh, structure, contract stuff, um, systems. And it was honestly, I was expecting for lack of better terms, kind of a shit show because it was like, okay, we're all learning. We're basically going to build the plane while we're flying it at this point. Right. And it wound up being, we put in so much effort into it that it wound up being pretty smooth. Um, so before we get into the transition. Yeah. Because you're a black and white analytical guy. Yeah. Tell us specifically, what was it about the EXP model? Because there's commission split, there's the cap, yeah. there's technology, there's lead generation, there's revenue share, and there's stock. Those are the six major pillars um, that EXP is built on. Yeah. What was it for you guys, since the money didn't matter, because you guys were already making plenty of money and you weren't thinking yeah. about the money that you were leaving on the table? What was it for you, since you're the one that pretty much drove the truck, because Amy admittedly was just, she just wanted to sell homes and she didn't really yeah. care. That's where still she the was. case with her. Yeah. <laughs> but, so, but what was it for you out of those six things? What was it that 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 made your eyes go, we got to be there? I would say ultimately it came down to a financial item uh, because at the end of the day, like if you're going to grow a team and you're going to and build a group, you a big part of that is having not just people because you can throw people into a mix. It's all about having the right people. And the only way to really attract the right people is to create an environment that people want to be a part of. And when I think about it that way, it's like, OK, well, how do I make this attractive for other people? Well, I need to make it good for them. So the best option for me is why I have the most free capital to work with. We're already naturally like we want everybody on the team to succeed, but we had to have free capital to do it. And I knew from the beginning that we were simply at a massive disadvantage financially when the total cash flow difference was obscene. I mean, it was six figures for the team. Right. You know, the team revenue was six figures twice um, at our volume level. So, so you're saying um, because you guys weren't getting as much as you could, you could only pay so, so much, much out. Yeah. and you'd have to pay a much higher split to compensate. So, yeah. which is giving even more money away. And, which and it makes must it have very been, hard to continue to advertise and lead gen and do all the things for the team that we want to do. And profit. You want yeah, to profit. And profit. Yeah. At the end of the day, that's part of the game too. <laughs> well, that's, I mean, at the end of the day, none of it matters if you're not, you know, making your family better. Yeah. So that was that ultimately for, like for you coming from Howard Hanna, the big thing was just the, 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 the commission split. Now with your team agents, now that they're on a um, $8,000 split cap, and then we're, we're right now in the process of changing to a mega icon team. So they'll be at a $4,000 cap, which and the mega icon team is 16,000 for Amy and then 4,000 for each of the other agents. Yes. Um, it also takes their cap transaction fee. There's no $250 cap transaction fee. It's 75. 75. So, so they save through each agent on our team saves 4,000 on their cap when we become a mega icon team. And they also, Plus they're another, part of the 250. Yeah. They also save another 20 times. What is it? 175 times 20 deals ish. Yeah. Um, yeah. How many of the five roughly. So, I mean, that's pretty good money too. I mean, that's napkin math in my head. That's probably three or four grand also um, right around. Right. Um, Once you get to the le level where you've got at least 10 producing agents, um, where they're, you know, a $4,000 um, cap works out to 20,000 in GCI. Yeah, it's very All they got to do is 20,000 in GCI. They're part of it to make yeah. their $4,000 cap. It makes it just from who I, the other, I've talked to a lot of team leaders, a lot. Every one of them says that, the $4,000 cap or even the $8,000 cap. But when you make it to the mega icon level, um, if you're a brokerage with over 10 agents or yeah. if you've got a team with over 10 producing agents, they can make so much more money. It, it's because, a massive amount, yeah. Yeah, like compared to just about any other brokerage. Um, and you don't have to pay, so you don't have to pay 80% or 85 because- once they burn through that, the cap, they're getting way better. Splits, Twenty thousand yeah. is less than a million in sales. 
And you don't want agents that are doing less than that anyway, really. They're not doing themselves any favors. No, if anything, it's, and and I mean, minus new people, because new people will do That's that different. for six they're gonna, months or so. They're working but, towards it. Yeah. But yeah, we want to get it to where we can help people really really grow. And, and one thing that's, that's totally different also that I thought about was over the years at the, at the standard brokerage and at not Howard Hanna specifically, it's any standard brokerage, anywhere where you're, um, I would say that really anywhere without a cap generally or without revenue sharing also revenue sharing is the, the piece of this, the cap and revenue sharing make this part happen. But our biggest fear was always that we would help, we would have somebody on our team become successful and leave. Well, that's um, the problem. That because is then you the... lose your best agent. Yeah. But now it's it it flips that script because the best thing we can have happen now is we have somebody on our team become a mega superstar and they're helping us retire and we help them do it because it becomes more of a this instead of like this with our you're own aligned team. you're yeah, it's an it aligned aligns partnership. With our and for those are the that, same now. for those that don't understand what he's saying is at any traditional real estate company um and let's keep in mind, Howard Hanna at least doesn't have a franchise fee. Most of yeah. the others do. So you've got no, you know, no cap and a franchise fee, um, yeah. with the exception of you know Remax and Keller Williams, mostly uh, two excellent companies. But at the traditional companies, um, you're going to have no cap and you're going to have the franchise fee, and it just yeah. makes it much much harder. And then once you have an agent, realize that they're taking home so much less. They're working to get off the team quicker because it doesn't make sense for them to stay around any longer than they need to because they're going to start doing the math on their own. They're, yeah. You're attracting good people to your team. They're going to be thinking people with brains who want the best for them and their families. And they're going to start realizing that if they're on a 60% of 80%, that's really only 48% and 52% is going to the house. And what can yeah. they do to get all yeah. of that or some of it back? Yeah. So they're going to be. They're going to be much more incentivized to leave your team. But at EXP, because it's a low cap, you provide a lot of value, hopefully. That's your job. But even if they do leave the team, they're still going to be in your revenue share organization so that you continue getting uh, paid revenue share from the company while they stay at EXP. Yeah. Unless they're just not happy and they leave the company. But most teams... If they're at any other brokerage that the agent leaves the team, even if they stay at the company, you make no more money on them ever. Only the broker does. Yeah. So now you've put yourself where you've pretty much got your a virtual brokerage where you're getting paid on anyone who stays within your organization. Correct. Yeah. And it, it would be honestly, if anybody that's doing the math and, and, and most of the successful agents do, I mean, that's why you see the big teams going to EXP, I think is because that you can't beat the math. Um, you can't beat the math in the combination of stability. The company has been around 15 years. You know, like there's there's some other, bro like real brokers, a good comparison. I don't know that one that well because I never really got that deep into it because it was, they're too new. But EXP has been around 15 years, has a clean balance sheet with great revenue and great cost. I know they're going to make it through pretty much anything at this point. They've been around 87,000 agents. I was talking yeah. to an agent today and um and their broker called when they were talking, he found out that they were thinking about leaving and going to EXP. And he said, well, you know, they're a failing company. And it's like, well, it's not, 80, that's not the case. 87,000 agents, <laughs> uh, debt free with no real estate. Yeah. There's, there's no, there's nothing to pay bills and, and just the overall structure, you know, the lack of, you don't have region managers or, you know, two vice presidents of every, it's a very streamlined system. And, Honestly, I was pretty impressed with like the ability to talk to people like now it does help. I knew someone in, you know, the first couple of days we had some things we had questions about. Well, someone who I used to know up here works down in Columbus at EXP now that they were actually at Howard Hanna before. So I was able to reach out to her because she does the contracts and compliance and right. stuff like that. So I was able to get some real quick answers. But then once I learned the system, the work chat, I mean, I've had times where the only real fear we had was it was kind of like going from being in a brokerage where they, they watch over you and take care of you. And to me, I had this little fear that we do a lot of transactions and we're kind of going to be out in the ocean in a rowboat, just rowing around with no help. And I, that was the biggest misconception that was completely false. I've messaged the broker on a Saturday night, like, like early on, she called us at like nine 30 on a Saturday Sarah night for an answer. Yeah. Sarah did. There is was, an amazing human being. That is. Yeah. And she actually helped us. I mean, we've gone through some personal stuff. You know, it's 
as it's actually kind of a shame we haven't been able to enjoy how good this has been because <laughs> right, right. we've had some things like my mom's been sick and there's you right. know some we've been through some I would say in the last four the last three or four months we've been through one hell of a storm in our personal yeah, life you have, and I'm sorry with, fam that. with family stuff and things that you know all good stuff but it was all stuff that we couldn't control it's all health or you know things right. with kids and things like that and um, we've been through all that, but she actually did give us some great guidance once she, she actually suggested a book that I've wound up listening to like three times on ebook. Wow. It's like, a, it's like a, maybe like an hour and a half listen. Um, and it was exactly what we needed at that point in our life, because it, it was so, so many parallels to our life right now. And it was just odd how she, it was almost like she was a clairvoyant there. And I can't say enough good things about Sarah. She was, I mean, just outstanding to work with. Um, we've, so we've gone to her on a lot of stuff. That leads me to the next thing, bringing the team over. I already know the answer because we went through it together. What was the transition, the actual transition like? One of the misconceptions is, like you said, you're moving onto an island, you're by this, yourself, they're a cloud-based broker, so you're pretty much on your own. You're not going to get the support. Uh, they don't have anything in place to help you. What did you actually experience with you and your team members as you were moving over? What did that look um, like for you? I would say from a support side, the polar opposite. Now there's always things that aren't perfect. And well, I wouldn't say not perfect. This isn't a knock on it. Right. It's overwhelming the amount of stuff you get, but you're transferring to a new brokerage. They've actually got a very organized system where they send out those emails and they have, if you follow, if you print it out and follow through like a checklist, it's not bad, but it feels like a lot because you're learning new stuff. Oh, sure. You're learning all these new systems and you're still right. selling. There's still sales flying around everywhere. So but did us, you feel like, did you feel like there were people in place to help you? Yes, very much. And I mean, it was more just once you knew who to reach out to. I mean, if you just replied to the email that came to you with those checklists, it was I think Christina Marshall, yeah, right. the one in Ohio. Um, she was awesome to deal with. I mean, every I and mean, I still talk to them all the like through that the messenger app all the time. I mean, and and I'll go on. I do go on the world once in a while. I mean, I always thought that was corny, but I'll tell you what, it's really well executed. Um, you literally click go to accounting. Right. And I can ask, hey, I need I need proof that this was paid on something or whatever. There's no quicker way. I'm a very cynical human and I bashed EXP hard for five years with my yeah. buddies. And by the way, they're all here now. They're all at EXP with me. But we used the, all the same stuff. EXP World is a joke. It's a, a video game. It's a gimmick. I thought the same thing, but I've used it and it's pretty damn good. <laughs> it's the quickest way to get customer service, period. End of story. Yeah. You can, it's like having a Zoom meeting that you have access to with an avatar. They talk about the avatars and the cartoons. Fact yeah, of the I'm not on, is, yeah, I'm not on there eight hours a day walking around or no, anything. No, but, you, but can access, you can access 50 to 80 hours a week of coaching and training in there. You can yeah. access accounting. You can access uh, any of like KV Core. You can access onboarding agent support. They're open till 11 o'clock at night. It's there's no quicker way. We're all used to sending an email, waiting two days for a response or leaving a message or staying on hold. You can yeah. literally get in and talk to any of these people face-to-face -face on your computer screen uh, inside of two or three minutes. Yeah, it's very quick. And it's um, once you realize it's there, I mean, that's that was the hardest thing is like, you, have to, you do have to sit down and read the intro email. It tells you everything you need to know if you sit down and read it. The problem is like a lot of people are like real quick and just go, oh, I'll just deal with that later. Then it gets buried by the 300 other emails and they don't do it. That intro email is the most important piece to me. Um, then having like good sponsors and good people that you can reach out to. Like, I know we asked you a few questions early on, but I think it was maybe a week and we had it. Like it was not yeah. even a week. I mean, I think that it was within a half a week. We knew where to find everything, what to do. Um, but we fully enthralled ourselves in it. I mean, we, we, threw our, we threw everything we had at it just to learn it and to be ready. And honestly, that was... It was like flipping a light switch and business as usual. Um, right. It really, uh, business as usual, same job and essentially more money flying around to spread out however we want to spread it, whether it's keeping more for you, spending more on ads, paying more to your team or a little bit of all, which is what we did. Um, that's ultimately what it's all about. And uh, it's a perfect it's a perfect structure for that. I, I think of all these companies more as a structure because- It's a platform. Yeah, it's a platform. You can't operate as a solo real estate agent without a broker. So if you have to have a broker, you have to understand that, okay, is that bro what is that broker doing that actually makes you money? And in a lot of cases, you know, with us, with the amount of advertising, and we had many incidences of this, but with the advertising we do because of the type of team we like to run, and, and we started from zero. This isn't a multi-generational thing right, where, yeah. you know, like there's some people where their parents were established in the 80s. 
And now they're yeah, there. Right and now you like, guys, you built it all from nothing. Well, we're we're actively competing with those people already. Right. And now we've got this ability to have more revenue to play with. And it's dangerous. <laughs> I mean, because right. because I will say I've dug in enough and and I if I decide I'm gonna win, I'm gonna win. And now I have the backing of I have the extra capital and firepower to do it to where right. it's not as hard to do. And I if we can do whatever we want at this point because we have the ability to do it within the structure. If I want to add 10 people, I can do it like that. And, and you um, can grow it. You can grow a team outside of the area. You're not limited by. Uh, we're actively looking anymore. at that. Yeah. We're that's part of what I, I had a call with uh, Amy Bass yesterday from the, about the mega icon team. That's something we're going to be, we're going to have a couple satellite teams here fairly shortly. Um, I, hopefully this year it depends on the, the personal life stuff and how much that holds us back. Right. But uh, I've already got plans for probably two, at least two satellite teams, one within Ohio, one outside of Ohio. And then we're going to be actually down, down like we're uh, in the Marco Island area. Right. Um, that's going to be an area we're going to probably get involved with as well, because we've got, you know, we've got friends with a couple places down there and, yeah, you know, we have a plane we can travel so we can get down there. <laughs> so it's, you can now expand since EXP's one national one cap nationwide is the second one area cap. Um, all you need to do is get a license in that state and you can open up an expansion team in Columbus, Cincinnati, uh, yeah. St. Louis. Uh, and Los I learned Angeles. yesterday that an, ex an expansion team, you have to have a satellite team leader if it's anywhere over a hundred miles away, but there's, that's literally just a point person. Right. Um, if it's over a hundred miles away, that's like, that's a, and that person gets an $8,000 cap. There's, there's nuance to it. And it's really cool. Actually. I got a lot of good information out of that call yesterday. You I don't know if I know me. The platform allows you, for anyone who's listening to this, if you're an entrepreneur and a business person, this platform allows you to have a virtual brokerage. Yep. Anywhere you want. In 14 months, I've got 80 agents in my in my uh, virtual brokerage, 80, 80 yeah. in 14 months. I mean, I could have- well, We've grown by 50% in under a year. I mean, right. <laughs> our, um, team, so, our team, and that's all within our team. I mean, we don't do any type of actual recruiting, no, like outside of the team. We might someday, but it's not a, to us, it's like, we're having fun doing what we're doing and it's the game is what we like, you know, like um, I, we've had more people reach out to us asking questions about EXP than, than anything else. And it's been quite a few, I mean, we've had quite a few discussions and actually a couple of, a couple of fair, a couple of brokerages I've actually been engaged with. Right. Um, it's happening. They say they're all coming. Um some people chuckle, but it's happening. What I want to uh, real quick before we uh, wrap this up, now that your team's over here, um, and obviously I know this just from becoming friends with you and, and Amy, you guys care a lot about your team agents. They're friends and family of yours. What, yeah. What's the commentary from your team agents from their perspective? The benefit, give us some benefits that they're seeing for themselves. I, I would say the majority of them just like to sell homes. <laughs> and that's, right. Like that's the team that we have. They like to sell homes. Like they're, um, none of us are very big rah rah people. Like we don't ever right. really go to many events or conventions or yeah. anything. Like we're usually all like we're we've actually almost always ran like it. This is just much more compatible with how we run the team. We have basically a cloud based team already, and we did we always ran that way. We never went to meetings, we never went to events, we've never done any of that, and we probably never will. Um, I hate to say the word never though because that could change too, but in general. I mean, everybody's everybody's making more per transaction, and that's what matters the most to them. Um, and we've got some systems in place now that we're, um, and it's more on the admin side. But like, I have I actually have like capture systems so that when they sell a house, they have it's automatic where it captures the the client's contact info so they can reach out. Some of right. that stuff I just didn't couldn't do before without having a freestanding thing that they had to plug things into. Got now it. it's automatically harvested when they turn a sale in. Oh, and it's done in-house as opposed to, you know, going somewhere else where we don't have access to our data. What about the stock with these agents? Are they I taking advantage of the, the agent equity? I think the majority of them, I'm, I know Sarah's, I think the majority of them, I'm not positive if it's all of them, the, but the vast majority of them are, are doing the stock purchase. Right. Um, so that means you get, you can take 5% of your commission and buy EXPI yeah. stock at a 10% and 10 discount. off too. And, and honestly, I'm looking at that like, Right now, I mean, everything in the tech sphere is are, is actually undervalued a little bit now because oh, you had yeah. that you had that bubble in the tech stack. So, and, and EXP gets lumped into that. The stock market's not really about company performance. So, like, you'll hear people go, "Oh, the stock's driving." It's like, yeah, that whole sector is like everything. The entire in the Nasdaq's down thirty percent. It doesn't matter. 
Yeah. Um, so to me, I look at that as I know the balance sheet's good. I know the growth is good. I know the value is there and I'm buying it up on sale like crazy. No, I, <laughs> I love that. But now yeah, your I team agents get, I was talking to a guy the other day. Now your team agents get to build a Morgan Stanley ShareWorks account and have stock yeah. build up for them. They're trying to recruit to the team. They, they, they want yeah. the team to grow because now they get to share in the revenue, right? Yeah. And that, that's the beauty of how we have it. Like with us doing the, when we do the transition and do the mega icon team, one of the great things about that is, you know, they can attract people to the team because you get a low cap and you get, we have lead flow and, and then you also have the opportunity to buy stock. So it's, it's almost a no brainer for a lot of people. Um, whether you want to be on a team or you want to be a team lead, it's hard to be um, in either shoe, in either set of shoes. Some people don't want to lead their own team and that's cool. We're, we're there for them. Um, we're there to make them as successful as they want to be. And then if that ever changes, we'll help them grow their own team too, because that benefits us in the end. It, it all, it benefits, everybody benefits from helping each other, which is everybody's kind of an alien money. concept in a lot of real estate circles. Usually um, you're, you're training your competition. Uh, it's, yeah. it's a, it's a race to zero on the commission splits. Uh, who yes. will take the least amount from you until it's until they're letting you work there for free or you're letting them work yeah. there for free, right? That's usually, there's a lot of destructive competition going on within our, within our profession and yeah. um, EXP has created where they're not, you're not just focused on the commission because you can make it up in stock. You can make it up in revenue share yes. if you choose. You, your only lane isn't commission anymore. That's correct. Yeah. And it's, it's makes it much better just as just holistically, it's a, it's a much better picture that way to me. And I think that that's why you're seeing the other brokerages that are kind of similar popping up um, and oh, showing yeah. up everywhere. It's pretty um, scary for these legacy brokers, but beca because the other, that all the new, the new companies that are coming out, that are coming on board or coming on to, into the forefront that are starting up, they are cloud-based, publicly traded real estate yeah. companies as well. And it seems like that's the shift. Just like Netflix used to be the only streaming. Now everybody yeah. does. Paramount, Hulu. I mean, everybody's streams now. Nobody well, sells hardware. And to be perfectly honest, I thought that was crazy when I thought Netflix should just keep shipping DVDs. I thought it was crazy when they got into streaming. But look at they don't they don't send you DVDs in the mail anymore. It's no. a totally different business. They actually took a model of sending you CDs and evolved into pure streaming because it was either evolve or die. And I think that that's not just true for brokerages, but for agents themselves as well. Like if you're looking to be in the business and being successful 20 years from now, what you do now really matters. And, and that was a big reason that to me, when we had that window, I, there was a lot of urgency on it. Cause it's like, look, we might not get another shot at this for five years. We had this weird area of time where right. we had a slow week or two. And it was like, right. you have to do something about it. And that was, right. that was in my, the back of my head was my flight instructor. Like, how are you sitting? What, what do you think? And I, I, we identified the situation, but it was time to do something about it. And that's why we, when we moved, it was quick. It was not a, uh, right. it was a whirlwind <laughs> and it was, right. And that's even, that way. but even the way you did it is a bad mentality. Cause you never yeah. want to, you know, when you're, when you're selling 15 homes a month, yeah, you should never was a bad mentality, but we were scared of the. Right. But you should never be in a position where you have no deals pending. You should never yeah. be in a position where all of your sales are done. Right. So yeah. it, I don't know that that'll ever happen again. I mean, it was, yeah, a, I hope it doesn't. It was kind of a once in a, I don't think it's happened at any point. Now, granted some closings moved up earlier to accommodate that. No, no I one mean, wants to be in a position where they've sold all their listings. They've all yeah. their buyers are under contract and close. <laughs> yeah, that's the last time. That's a, that's the last place you want to be to move. So that's usually you right when you rip you're the band-aid off and do it. <laughs> yeah. Listen, that, is, that is the truth. Yeah. And I would say that the biggest, the biggest mistake we ever made was not taking a hard look earlier in the cycle because we were 100% focused on build, 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 build. Well, we didn't start with the end in mind. Well, the end would have been, okay, well, what happens when you build this huge thing and the structure is so expensive for you? And that's where we were kind of teetering on where it was like, okay, we can't give anymore because one bad month There's can wait no profit. Right. Yeah, because you have costs that come in no matter what. And now it's like, I mean, we cruised through this winter with me and Amy basically living in a hospital for a month and not, not doing much of anything. And it was one of the least painful winters we've had 
right. in a while. And it was in this environment where interest rates are going like this and right. sales volumes going like this. Because your costs and are low. We didn't, yeah, the costs were lower and we really didn't feel it the same way I would have expected. I would have expected to have to like pull savings and do stuff like that. And we were able to just kind of slide right through That's a awesome. really nasty storm of our life um, between the market, the, the personal stuff, the interest rates, all that stuff crushing at once. And usually if it hadn't been for the fact that we were stuck, that's usually when I do my best work is when my back's against the wall. Um, but it was like, we didn't have it. It just kind of never happened. I'm so glad it, it didn't happen. That makes up for the yeah. what you went through last spring, having no deals pending. The last thing then, what, what, what would you, or what do you tell other agents that are thinking about EXP or team leaders or small brokers or whatever, since you've been here for 10 months, what, you know, what do you say to these people? Well, there's probably multi-pronged, depending on where you're at in your career. If you're planning on being, if you're that agent doing five, six, seven million, that's planning on growing into something big and wants to be the superstar, you really need to think about where you're going to wind up someday because your window gets more difficult, the bigger you get. Um, and that was, that's a big Very thing. True. Um, the, uh, you know, that's, that's probably the biggest thing is don't wait to do something about your business is the biggest thing. I mean, that's the biggest advice I can give to anybody is don't wait until you have a problem, fix it before it's a problem. Most, have human, a beings, most human beings wait until they've got a problem to do anything. Yeah. And then they yeah. still don't do anything. They freeze. Yeah. And that's where that do something about it is, uh, you know, and, and honestly, you always have to do the math too. I, I think that, uh, doing the math is the most important part of running any business. I think doing the math and having a little bit of vision, you have to be able to do the math now and project it out and say, mm -hmm. if I do this, this will happen. Um, that's important. And then, uh, I will say the, the biggest thing out of all this is the misconceptions I even had, even when we moved, I still had misconceptions. Dude, we both had them. Yes. I had them right up until even the day we moved. Like I had that, like, I still had that kind of ingrained in my brain because there is a lot of propaganda out there right? because people, there are the legacy brokers there. There is. It some comes out. There. It comes from fear. They're just, yeah. they're like, Holy God, they, this is There's, a real thing. A very smart person taught me a long time ago when I used to manage people at UPS, I had a, about a hundred employees there back then. And they, uh, this guy is a, actually was a client of Amy's last year. He moved down to Texas. Awesome guy. Um, and he told me, he sat me down at one point when I was maybe like 25 years old and I had like 80 employees. I was in so far over my head. It wasn't even funny. And he taught me how to manage people, but also it's important to understand that that's how everybody reacts, but he was framing it in the managing people sense, but it's important to know this about yourself, that there's two things that motivate anything on this planet, whether it's a plant or a animal or a person, you have pleasure and you have pain and people will do a whole lot more to avoid pain than they will to gain pleasure. So the fact that we could make more money wasn't enough of a motivator. It's pain that would motivate you. And pain is what ultimately motivated us. But if you know that about yourself um, and you recognize that natural genetic fault that we all have, that we're, that sometimes we need pain to motivate us, you can begin to say, I've got a goal and I'm going to motivate myself to go for the positive stimulus instead of running from the negative. And I think that that's really profound. I think it's a, it's a realization that you have to have. And it's a really, it's kind of a difficult thing to grasp, but it's just true of anything. Every animal person doesn't matter is measured. Literally there's two stimuli that motivate behavior and it's those and, two pleasure and pain. Right. And we usually as humans, for the same reason that most of us don't have a ton of money, most of us don't see, ever see our full, our full potential. Um, a lot, we have trouble staying physically fit. We have trouble maintaining relationships. It's because we have trouble getting new habits, being consistent, taking action, and yeah. moving towards opportunity. Um, because there's no pain making you do it. <laughs> and we don't like getting out of the comfort zone. Yeah. All right, man. Thanks for coming on today. I really appreciate it. Great talking it. to you.